Henry Jekyll. I've done nothing. I'm Dr. Jekyll. I'm Dr. Henry Jekyll, I tell you. I've done nothing. You're looking for a man named Hyde. Hyde! I'm Dr. Henry Jekyll. I'm Dr. Jekyll! I tell you, I tell you, I'm Dr. Jekyll! Hello and welcome to We Read This. My name's Ash and since it's just been Halloween we thought we'd return to our recent subject Robert Louis Stevenson and this time discuss what is perhaps his most famous work, Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. It's one of those stories so well known that you don't need to read it to have read it, one which has been so frequently adapted, translated, parodied and alluded to that if you haven't read it before or just haven't read it in a very long time you might be surprised by what the original actually contains and what it doesn't. Rereading it, I found Jekyll and Hyde were full of surprises. So today, with the assistance of my own accomplice, Adam, I want to explore what I'd missed out on or forgotten. You know what I'd forgotten? Just how short this thing was. Yeah, I it's know. It's like 40-odd pages. He gets so much done. He, he covers a lot of ground. Yeah. Is there, a class, is there another classic that, you know, has such staying power like this that's so short? A couple of Dickens ones aren't. That's Christmas Carol's Although not all that Christmas long. Although Christmas Carol's is a good hundred, I reckon. Mm-hmm. Double the length. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's extraordinary how much happens. And <clears> how little... I don't know, you, you hit upon an idea that's so fascinating, kind of morbidly fascinating. Mm-hmm. I think one of the characters describes seeing Hyde and describes his own feelings about it as he had like a disgusted curiosity. Hmm, that's, be- very, that's very Lovecraft. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, he keeps... Because he keeps... It all locked up. Uh-huh. Like what is what is going on? I mean, everyone knows the twist. It's one of yeah. those books that you have to accept. It is it is a kind of game all the way through. It's like I wonder what I'd be feeling if I didn't yet know that Jekyll and Hyde yeah. are the same person. Because the I, the idea for for the, the maybe two or three people in the world who don't know mm. that goes through, and he he feel Hyde has just moved into Jekyll's place. Yeah, and he's worried about Jekyll, so he goes to look for him. And then it's revealed that he drinks a potion that turns him into Hyde. Yeah. Is the basically the entire plot Setup. of the, the book. And you would think if you came up with a golden goose like that, you'd you have would you would six sequels on a well you a radio adaptation. Oh you'd at least make it a hundred pages long. You'd you'd enjoy the you've basically got a setup where you've got one character who can be two characters and no one else knows. Yeah. I think um, the possibilities Carry on Jekyll and Hyde. <laughs> Well, I mean, possibilities clearly are endless because they have made this film and not always. Well, I think um, that's what I was talking about earlier. I think there's an end, there's an endless fascination with this idea. Yeah, is that your inner evil can manifest physically? There were practical reasons for the novella's length. Charles Longman had come to Stevenson asking for a ghost story for the Christmas issue of Longman's magazine. I was very hard up for money, said Stevenson, and I felt that I had to do something. I thought and thought, and tried hard to find a subject to write about. At night I dreamed the story, not precisely as it is written, for of course there are always stupidities in dreams, but practically it came to me as a gift. And what makes it more odd is that I am quite in the habit of dreaming stories. I go on making them whilst I sleep quite as hard, apparently, as when I am awake. They sometimes come to me in the form of nightmares, insofar that they make me cry out loud, but I am never deceived by them. Even when fast asleep I know that it is I who am inventing, and when I cry out it is with gratification to know that the story is so good. For instance, all I dreamed about Dr. Jekyll was that one man was being pressed into a cabinet when he swallowed a drug and changed into another being. I awoke and said at once that I had found the missing link for which I had been looking for so long, and before I again went to sleep, almost every detail of the story, as it stands, was clear to me. Of course, writing it was another thing. Stevenson wrote Jekyll and Hyde in 1885, as he lay in bed in Bournemouth, feverishly ill and hemorrhaging from the lungs. While Stevenson's story of the dream implies Jekyll and Hyde came from nowhere, its ingredients had been stewing with him for a while. Andrew Lang, friend of Stevenson, said that ten years before Jekyll and Hyde came about, he told me once he meant to write a story about a fellow who was two fellows, which did not, when thus stated, seem a fortunate idea. Claire Harmon, one of Stevenson's biographers, suggests that the vague guilt and melancholia that Dr Jekyll possesses could have been based on the author's father. 
Like his son's creation, he had perhaps an overfine conscience about his shortcomings, shown in the story as a mark of extreme moral vanity. I mentioned in our last episode on Stevenson the Edinburgh references that may have contributed to Jekyll and Hyde. Deacon Brody, the unhinged cabinet maker, the crimes of Burke and Hare, as well as the two faces of the city itself, the decadent intellectual new town and the polluted crime-ridden old town. The creation myth of Jekyll and Hyde is a murky one, and not much demystified by the author or his wife. Elsewhere, Stevenson gives another version of his dream. I dream the scene at the window and a scene afterwards split in two, in which Hyde, pursued for some crime, took the powder and underwent the change in the presence of his pursuers. For two days after that, said Stevenson, I went about racking my brains for a plot of any sort. Then there is the story of the first draft, allegedly put together in three days. Stevenson's wife Fanny told him it was too sensational and it lacked an allegory. Furious, Stevenson is then said to have burnt the manuscript, horrifying Fanny by pointing to the ashes and saying bitterly that she was right. But this is according only to Fanny and it is not recorded anywhere in Stevenson's own papers. However, he would have indeed been prickly at the accusation of sensationalism. The year before, the Pall Mall Gazette had featured its own Stevenson Christmas crawler, The Body Snatchers, a story based much more explicitly on the crimes of Burke and Hare. To advertise it, the Gazette had hired six sandwich men around London to stand about wearing coffin-shaped boards and plaster skulls, a gaudy move that caused Stevenson much discomfort. Whatever the true genesis of Juckel and Hyde was, it certainly seems to have come about quite quickly, completed in around six weeks. In January of 1886, it was published by Longmans and sold 40,000 copies in six months. An estimated quarter of a million copies were sold in the States. Despite the effort to turn down sensationalism, the book was a huge hit and remains very popular to this day. So it's odd that most people are likely getting three things wrong just from the cover. First off, the title, Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Not The Strange Case or A Strange Case. Secondly, it's suggested by some Stevenson scholars that we're pronouncing Jekyll's name wrong. It's Jekyll, not Jekyll. This is illustrated by choices of names in parody versions that followed George Grossmith's Hyde and Seekle in 1888, as well as Punch's story of Dr. T and Mr. H, where T stands for treacle. In the same send-up, Utterson becomes Stutterson and Lanyon, Onion. In 1887, a New York production presented Dr. Freckle and Mr. Snide, and I suppose over time the Scots pronunciation has been lost. Finally, and most embarrassingly, we're all saying the author's name wrong, or at least I am. It's pronounced Brenda Louis Stevenson. No, Robert Lewis Stevenson. He changed the spelling to L-O-U-I-S from L-E-W-I-S, but the pronunciation remained the same. I'm going to make an effort to start pronouncing his name properly. It's the least he deserves, really. However, I think the damage to Jekyll has been too severe, and I'm starting to call him Jekyll now would be like starting to call Don Quixote Don Quixote. It's not because I'm correct, but too far gone. And Quixote just makes me think of Quick Fix or Nesquik. So I think I mentioned this in a previous episode, but I don't think this book f- is f- was famously written by Robert Louis Stevenson. I think a lot of people would be surprised to find it was written by Robert Louis Stevenson. They assume it's a folk tale. A folk tale, or it's just a common heritage of man or whatever, where it's just, oh, it has an author, and it's Robert Louis Stevenson. Yeah. And the fact that I can see the copy you've been reading from, it's just whacked in with a whole other bunch of short stories. Yeah. By the way, just to follow up on our previous um, Robert Louis Stevenson episode, Olala is the name of the vampire story. He, so he did write a vampire yeah, story? Yeah. Interesting. Because okay. it's in that book. And um, what, what did you make of it? It's fucking bonkers. It's exactly <laughs> how I remembered it. What's spookier? Olala or Jekyll and Hyde? Oh, Jekyll and Hyde by miles. Stevenson's friend, Andrew Lang, said that reading Jekyll and Hyde produced such an emotion that I threw the manuscript on a chair and scuttled apprehensively to the safety of bed. And he was far from alone. The book was the talk of the town, and if you didn't have a shilling for your copy of this shocker or Penny Dreadful, you weren't worth talking to. It attracted much interest from the theatrical world. One of the first versions of Jekyll and Hyde on stage was Thomas Russell Sullivan's 1887 adaptation starring Richard Mansfield as Jekyll and Hyde. He was still performing a year later when the Whitechapel murders began. One audience member was so terrified by Mansfield's on-stage transformation from Jekyll into Hyde that they reported him to the police on suspicion of being Jack the Ripper. Stevenson apparently approved of this production and Mansfield's performance, though perhaps more because he was paid for the rights, not always a guarantee in those days. However, he didn't live to see any of the cinematic adaptations of his novella. Jekyll and Hyde have had an astonishing run at the movies. They first appeared in the frontier days of cinema in 1908, 
and a new version is due next year. How many adaptations of Jekyll and Hyde have you seen? It, it's almost impossible to say because after a point, it's just it's a tale as old as time. Mm. Uh, is Jekyll and Hyde the adaptation? As they are they adapting? Is the story of man's inner demons? Does Jekyll and Hyde own that? I mean, lit- literally adaptations oh. of Stevenson. Um, not many actually. No, no, not personally. I've been flicking through a few preparing for this. How many are there? Tons, man. Really? Yeah. If you any look famous up, ones? Yeah, yeah. There's a. Um, this isn't even the most famous one, but it's the first one that came to mind because Michael Caine's in it. Okay. Not good. Have you noticed if any of them are the same actor playing? Yeah, a lot of them are. I think Spencer Tracy plays okay. Jekyll and Hyde. Well, because I oh I remember um, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Mm. Jekyll and Hyde are a character. Yeah. And they function exactly the same way as the Hulk does in the in the Avengers. Vladimir Nabokov was quick to warn his students about the dangers of being poisoned by Jekyll and Hyde at the movies. You will ignore the fact that ham actors under the direction of pork packers have acted in a parody of the book. Did you ever watch Arthur as a kid? Arthur? Arthur, the American... Like, he's, he was an aardvark. He was like an animated oh, kid show. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Do you remember the... Um, there was a library card. There was a song about a library card. There's an episode about library cards. No, I don't. And they sing a song about library cards. <laughs> and the... Um, the mid-interstitial song Breakdown is one of the characters saying the words Jekyll, Jekyll, Hyde, Jekyll, Hyde, Hyde, Jekyll over and over again. Really? Yeah. <laughs> maybe that should, I maybe use that as the theme for this, for this one. Yeah. Because um, I didn't know what to use. So yeah, I'll, do, I'll try and find that. Just type in... Um, Jekyll, Jekyll, Hyde, Jekyll, Hyde, Hyde, Jekyll. Um, having fun you... isn't hard when you have a library card <laughs> is the name of the song. Okay. How do you know that? I watched, everybody watched Arthur. I feel like you're probably the odd one out here. No. If you've ever thought a filmmaker's claiming to bring to life a novel a bit arrogant, Nabokov has a gorgeous put-down. It seems to me to call a movie house a theatre is the same as to call an undertaker a mortician. One reason for Jekyll and Hyde's silver screen stamina is its open-endedness. Its content can be reshaped to fit many theories, something literary critics and adapters alike can profit from. Cinema has found the Hyde side dependably plastic, there are Dr. Jekyll and Miss Hyde, a Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde, a black exploitation movie with the thoughtful spin Dr. Black and Mr. Hyde, and a version in which Hyde is indeed revealed to be Jack the Ripper. Patrick Brantlinger has proposed the novel was an unconscious allegory about the commercialization of literature. The existence of a porn version called Dr. Jekyll and Mistress Hyde simultaneously confirms this theory while telling it to go screw itself. Everything is true, Stevenson said to Sidney Colvin. Only the opposite is true too. You must believe both equally or be damned. There are a couple of, just to come back to adaptations, there are a couple that look a bit um, a bit dodgy, a bit like Caliban, a bit racial. Are they all period pieces? No, there's some horrific, the worst ones, mm-hmm. um, even worse than the racist ones, um, oh. are noughties. Really? And it's all to do with, there's one where Jekyll's trying to find the cure for cancer. And Hyde is a internet avatar of his. It's so bad. Oh, so it's about internet trolling. It's a little bit lawnmower man and not in a good way. In the interest of truly appreciating the novel, we must make a conscious effort to do as Nabokov advises and ignore the cinema. Jekyll sells Bond too easily. Like Frankenstein, his adaptations are indivisible from our memory of the literature. So speaking of werewolves and Frankensteins, Mm -hmm. is Jekyll and Hyde a classic monster? I suppose so, yeah. Is it up there with Dracula and the Wolfman yeah. and the Swamp Thing? I think you've got to judge those on two merits. Mm-hmm. One is literary and then the other one is cinematic. cinematic yeah. And even though I'd love to hear if anyone says this is the gold standard Jekyll and Hyde film. Because well, like you, I don't think I've seen any Well, because I don't think through. there's a... Because I think all of these monsters are given their status in cinema by the Universal Monster movies. Yeah. I don't think, I don't think there's a Universal Jekyll and Hyde. Oh, I think one of them is. Really? Yeah. In that case, then, it never made its way into the sort of the pantheon of monsters. But I don't know. I don't know if it's... It's in, it's in the cultural consciousness, but it doesn't occupy the same space as Frankenstein, which I find interesting. It's much less... Um, everyone's reaction to Hyde is really subtle mm-hmm. and a bit obscure. They feel intense discomfort, displeasure, disgust vague disgust you know there's there isn't the flesh bubbling sort of scene there there isn't a huge monster reveal there's no kind of vampire attack creature from the swamp moment really 
which is why on rereading the story it becomes quite surprising that it has proved such a successful movie project over the years. Almost every major piece of action in this story is related secondhand. There is a great deal of talking, a great deal of worrying. There is also something amusingly anti-Hollywood about the names in Jekyll and Hyde, not only the fact that everyone's forgotten how to pronounce Jekyll, but that whilst it's set in London, a lot of the names are Scottish. One adaptation has in fact presented Jekyll as an Englishman and his Hyde persona as a Scot. It is in London, obviously. Yes. But um, I don't know if you remember, but the doctor that comes to the scene of the trampled girl mm -hmm. at the beginning is an Edinburgh man with a thick Edinburgh accent. And he is described as being emotional as a bagpipe. <laughs> <laughs> Which, if a non-Scottish writer wrote that, it would almost seem so... It would be like Crude, saying, yeah. yeah, a man the colour of lawn sausage. Came yeah. up, you know. he, was fr he was from Glasgow. <laughs> oh, so it's, there's always these... There's always, he, he can't help himself. No, he's like slamming his own... Um, his own wasn't folk. He, wasn't he, he? He could have just. He could have made that doctor either from a non-specific location, yeah. or from anywhere else. But he has to be from Edinburgh. Well, in a way, I think he was trying to make him sound like an esteemed doctor, which in the Times, if he was from Edinburgh, would have had. That would be a good, would have had clout. He'll yeah. be a good one. Um, but yeah, emotional as a bagpipe. Clayton Hamilton has said the story might be conceived as happening among the gloomy doorways and narrow winds of the Scottish capital, and it's not hard to see where he got that idea. The fog still slept on the wing above the drowned city, where the lamps glimmered like carbuncles, and through the muffle and smother of these fallen clouds, the procession of the town's life was still rolling in through the great arteries with a sound as of a mighty wind. But the most anti-cinematic factor of Jekyll and Hyde is the uncertainty of the book. It seems we never get a good visual on our man. A character called Enfield gives us our first confused description. A little man, he calls him. Then shortly after, says, it wasn't like a man. Pursuing him, he says, I took to my heels, collared my gentleman. And when he did, Hyde gives off a sense of black, sneering coolness. Frightened, too, I could see that, but carrying it off, sir, really like Satan. What we anticipate with a monster is first seeing the shape, the shadow, the thing not quite right, something not like a man. We now await with morbid relish the reveal of what he actually looks like. Enfield collars him quickly, and though Hyde carries off like Satan, we get none of the devil's details. He's not sporting any lavish deformities or injuries. He's not fanged, pronged, or winged. He doesn't have gills. He's not wearing anything he's made out of skin. He's not in the act of slurping down a toddler's foot. He isn't even armed. And yet there's something off about him. And there's something off about this whole sequence. It's a mess of contradictions and multiple meanings. A little man, not like a man, now a gentleman... For all this, we might miss the strange counteracting force of Enfield taking to his heels in pursuit. When taking to your heels is what you do when fleeing, not pursuing. And there's a um, wonderfully creepy bit where um, he is just seen through a window and he waves yeah. at his friends, Utterson and someone else. I think it's the guy he's with at the beginning when he's, they witness Hyde trampling a girl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, know why I laughed at that. It's quite funny. It's, it's, it, the way it's described is sort of... I don't know, it's so archaic to us now, stamping. The, the trampling of, yeah. yeah. Um, it's almost like he's a vehicle, the way it's described. It's that he, he walked up to a girl and just kept going. <laughs> just like, walked, 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 walked off through, her. yeah. <laughs> you know. It's a comical crime because absurd. Here's what physically has happened. Hyde and the little girl are approaching one another from different directions. Hyde is heading eastward, the girl running hard down a cross street. They bump into one another at a corner, at which point the man trampled calmly over the child's body and left her screaming on the ground. It sounds like nothing to hear, but it was hellish to see. Note first of all that we don't hear that the girl falls over. No sooner than she has bumped into Hyde, she is being trampled underfoot. This sounds quite slapstick. One of those cinematic or animated pratfalls where in order for the drop to have a bit more punch, you cut out a few frames. Instead of the one showing a person falling, all the eye catches is a suggestion of a slap or a trip and then bang, the crumpled body is out cold on the floor. And that's before we even get to trampled calmly over. Hyde is a small man, yet trampled implies the force and volume of a herd of stampeding wildebeest or a mob. Enfield compares him to some damned juggernaut, using the name of the deity Krishna. The myth, as told in the edition I have of Jekyll and Hyde, goes as follows. Krishna was walking along and overheard a group of cowherding girls who were talking about how much they loved him. He was so overwhelmed by their talk 
that his eyes grew huge, his limbs shrank, and his mouth stretched into a gaping smile. In English usage, the word juggernaut was used to describe the huge wagon bearing the image of Krishna, which was paraded on festivals, under which devoted Hindus were said to have thrown themselves and so were crushed to death. The fact that all evidence indicates that such deaths were highly uncommon and accidental didn't stop the word juggernaut gaining the sense of a person or object that crushes anything in its path. Krishna was depicted as having a black face, a wide smile and no arms or legs, hardly the image of a demented trampler. Likewise, little Hyde seems physically incapable of such an act. There is also this trampling over business. I can accept that perhaps in real time what has occurred is that, is that the girl has bounced off Hyde and fallen on her back, or at the corner tripped, but there is deliberately no mention of this. Hyde goes straight over her like a train might. He goes through her, in fact. If Stevenson wanted the scene to be brutally realistic, he could have easily made it so. It wouldn't take much effort to have Hyde bat the girl to ground or angrily advancing despite the fact that she had fallen over. The deliberate omission means the effect is in fact strange before it's anything else. Either something isn't being said or Hyde is trampling her in some weird way, walking up her, over her and down her. It's still nasty, but it's not quite parody or farce by any means. Stevenson keeps us guessing, often revealing or subverting information within a sentence. Trampled calmly over the child's body and left her screaming on the ground. The fact that she is screaming on the ground actually comes as a relief. All the more of a relief if you've happened to laugh at this, because trampling the child's body indicates trampled to death. You know, she's just a body, just a body already. Our estimation of Hyde's power is made chaotic within a sentence. Luckily she lives, but for a moment there Hyde possessed the strength of a natural phenomenon. The girl had a minor collision, then was crushed to death by a superhuman juggernaut, then was hurt but alive. The Hulk is basically Jekyll and Hyde, isn't it? I suppose, yeah. I mean, yeah, magic potion... Magic, magic gamma rays. But it's not inner evil. I forgot. So I, I reread this when we decided we're going to do this spooky Halloween uh-huh. um, special. I'd forgotten something really, really basic about Jekyll and Hyde. About Jekyll and Hyde, which, which well, is the, 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 it's a narrator telling it, or no? I, I remembered it wasn't him until the end. Mm-hmm. Jekyll doesn't talk. You don't hear the voice of Jekyll yeah. until the end. <clears throat> what I'd forgotten is that Hyde is physically smaller than Jekyll. Yeah. Which is a weird one. Which is really important yeah. because he's smaller because there is less evil than good in Jekyll, mm-hmm. or at least that's his theory. But for some reason, and it's probably filmed, like yeah. League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, although I didn't think he was that big. I knew that was cartoonish. Hyde has always seemed to be portrayed as larger than... Yeah, I thought he was kind of Hulk, not Hulk, <clears throat> as in the Incredible Hulk, but kind of Bulk, gorilla-like. Yeah. There's a profoundly anti-romantic sentiment running through Jekyll and Hyde. In opposition to Wordsworth and Blake's vision of the child as an innocent, Stevenson said of his own childhood, I cannot allow that those halcyon days or that time of angel infancy have ever existed for me. Rather, I was born what I am now, Robert Louis Stevenson, and not any other or better person. Hyde is physically smaller with a greater love of life than Jekyll. Rather than being portrayed as siblings, Jekyll had more than a father's interest. Hyde had more than a son's indifference. The romantic sense of essential goodness lost in childhood and becoming a forgotten realm, tasted or sensed only in rare moments, is entirely turned on its head. Infants' heads are full of much more than Blake's sweet dreams of pleasant streams by happy, silent, moony beams. Instead, a child's selfishness and blind pursuit of desire is shown as a terrifying force. Tim Middleton places Jekyll and Hyde in the canon of gothic fictions which show late 19th century anxiety regarding what was increasingly perceived as the perilously narrow line between civilization and barbarism. What do you think of the idea that evil is ugly and good is beauty? That's, well, that's, that's the address, and that's what the, this book's addressing, is that you and a demon are, are ugly and vile and violent. Although, I, I'm not sure, do you think when people look on Edward Hyde, hmm. they feel... Is it terror or is it disgust? I think it's disgust. Yeah, because he's a he's a small monkey man who beats children to death. Yeah, like I don't. I think they're. If he was a huge hulking brute, then I think it would be terror. But I think it's the size that makes it. Uh, yeah, it made me think, and this is. Um, <clears throat> we're straying into a complete uh, theorizing, mm-hmm. but if you are, I don't know, if you're lucky enough to be able-bodied, and you are walking down the street and you see someone who's injured mm-hmm. in a in a kind of distorting way of no missing part of their head or something oh. the way it's described when people look on hide for the first time feels a bit like that or sometimes i don't know when you as if they're kind of just paralyzed with yeah they don't know what to make of it or 
Well, that's a very Lovecraft thing as well. I'm bringing him up again. Yeah. Where you expect one thing and you see another and it, it destroys your mind. It makes you feel, ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's a really, yeah. uh, it's a shameful kind of instinct for sev- several reasons. One is, you know, fear of your fellow man, but also fear of people who've probably... Well, fear fear of something... Injured or... Fear, fear of difference, fear of... Um, yeah, exactly. Well, it's a, it's a natural human reaction to fear something that should have a, a, a particular silhouette, but then it has a different silhouette. Yeah. Like I, when I was a kid, I always found, you know, that always in like Honey, I Shrunk the Kids or something. Mm where something that was supposed to be large was small or something that was supposed to be small was large. Yeah. That's a particular kind of fear. Like giant spiders. Mm. Spiders are supposed to be small, but giant spiders are scary because they're giant. Yeah. But if you see like a... And maybe we were preyed on. Maybe we were preyed on by... Those kind of things. Primitive having a giant spiders. A twitch in the spine. But if you see a, like a human being who's shrunk down to the size of a, a finger, mm. then that's also terrifying in its own way, you know. Subversion of expectation. I suppose it's why, you know, kids are used in horror movies so often. Well, kids are creepy. And to be honest, dwarves. Yes. Well, for the same reason. Less, less so these days. Oh, but yeah, because it's not okay. But it was a very, very common thing. There would be um, groups in Hollywood who their entire business model was hiring dwarves out for, yeah. for film use. Like um, Wizard of Oz, that was one troop. Yeah. And they're. They basically made their living by being professional dwarves. And actually, not too recently, I saw a Facebook post that was advertising for somebody with dwarfism to be an entertainer. Basically, to be part of a modern freak show, I think. Really? Yeah, just in terms of like a sort of stag do or a hen do kind of a thing. Oh, God, like midget tossing. Do you remember that whole scandal? Was that actually a thing or was that a joke? Yeah, no, no, it was a whole thing in, I think it was on a rugby tour. Oh, it's God. topical because it's it's the Rugby World Cup currently, and I think the England team was embroiled. However, it's not topical when we're talking, must be talking about Jekyll, Jekyll and Hyde. Hyde. <laughs> so what are the characters actually disgusted by? It evidently goes deeper than disliking the cut of Hyde's jib. Lanyon rationalises his hatred after discovering Jekyll's secret. I have since reason to believe the cause to lie much deeper in the nature of man and to turn on some nobler hinge than the principle of hatred. Another thing I wanted to ask you is that everyone, or rather, well, particularly Utterson, assumes that Hyde has some kind of malicious hold on Jekyll. That yes. they're two separate people, like everyone thinks. Hyde has a Soho address that Jekyll has sorted out for himself. And he comes round, he enters by the laboratory, and Jekyll has insisted to all his staff that they let him in and do, ever, do whatever he wants and orders. The, Utterson refers to what, ki- what kind of hold Hyde has on him. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I was going to ask you, what do you think they're thinking? Because that might be a clue to what Jekyll's sin is. like That he's, he's threatening him, mm. in a way, or he has some sort of blackmail... Yeah, that he has, I don't know, that he's he's so afraid of him that he will let him walk all over him, I yeah. think, is, is what, maybe what you're supposed to think. Yeah. If you're reading it as a contemporary reader back in the day and you, read, you didn't know the twist, you could only assume that Jekyll had committed some sin and Hyde was preying on him for with knowledge of that sin. Exactly what crimes Hyde is committing is kept murky. Jekyll saying, The pleasures which I made haste to seek in my disguise were, as I have said, undignified. I would scarce use a harder term. But in the hands of Edward Hyde, they soon began to turn towards the monstrous. We are made to guess what these monstrous pleasures are, and then amplify them when Jekyll says, My devil had been long caged. He came out roaring. Sexual deviancy and drug abuse seem to be being evoked at various times, although drug abuse seems a bit redundant after what Jekyll has put himself through. Take an elixir that transforms your mind and body in order to go out and smoke pot? Seems unlikely. There also appear to be a lot of homosexual insinuations. Whether that has any basis in Jekyll's behaviour or is simply on the minds of all the characters is up for debate. It turns me cold, says one, to think of this creature, Hyde, stealing like a thief to Harry's bedside. The implication here is that either a vital, young, though mysteriously repulsive man is carrying on a relationship with the older Jekyll, or simply that Hyde knows Jekyll is homosexual and is therefore blackmailing him. Homosexuality and blackmail walk the streets hand in hand at this point in history. In the year of Jekyll and Hyde's publication, according to Greg Boswell, Section 11 of the Criminal Law Amendment Act 1885 made gross indecency, a nebulous term that was not precisely defined, a criminal activity. 
In practice, the act was primarily used to prosecute homosexuals on the flimsiest of evidence and was dubbed a blackmailer's charter. The actual phrasing of this charter runs as follows. Any male person who, in public or private, commits or is a party to the commission by any male person of any act of gross indecency with another male person shall be guilty of a misdemeanour and being convicted thereof shall be liable at the discretion of the court to be imprisoned for any term not exceeding two years with or without hard labour. I quote that because of how appropriately oddly worded it is, almost like it is trying to be as elusive as Stevenson. Are there two male persons here or three? But there are some good reasons for suspecting homosexuality to be a buried theme. The story is full of unmarried men. We are three very old friends, Lanyon. We shall not live to make others. A something or nothing quote from Utterson. Perhaps he simply means one cannot make old friends. Or, these are three old bachelors who are friends because they all share the same secret. A cook and a housemaid are the only important female characters, if we don't count the young girl who gets trampled. Hyde's other victim, the murdered Sir Danvers Carew, is beaten to death by Hyde after accosting him in a very pretty manner, apparently inquiring his way which has been interpreted as a sexual proposition. Sir Carew's name in an earlier draft was Lemsome, and he behaved in a somewhat more feminine and caddish fashion, shielding his eyes under blue eyeglasses, a detail apparently based on William Wordsworth. Also in an earlier draft, Poole, Jekyll's manservant, says that his master's mirror has seen some queer doings. Hyde is described as being closer than a wife to Jekyll, and Jekyll himself is described as having feminine hands and being a large, well-made, smooth-faced man of 50, with something of a slyish cast perhaps, but every mark of capacity and kindness. In other words, if you want to read Jekyll's secret as being homosexuality, there's plenty of basis for it. But again, everything about this book seems volatile and mutable. Let's look at that description again. A large, well-made, smooth-faced man of 50. Well-made? It's a bit of a dark laugh about this in hindsight. Jekyll is anything but well-made. Smooth-faced, meaning youthful, or smoothed in a smooth operator, a bit slick. Someone, if we're going to push it, capable of smooth transitions. And then 50, the number most associated with halves. He has a slyish cast, perhaps, but every mark of capacity and kindness. On the left hand of the sentence, slyness. The right hand, kindness. And in the middle, every mark of capacity meaning capability, or in its scientific sense, capacity. Room enough for two. One sly, one kind. Importance is placed on lefts and rights, the two directions becoming signifiers for Jekyll and Hyde. Hyde's handwriting slopes to the left, Jekyll's to the right. Leftness, associated with oddness, not to mention the devil himself. When we first meet Hyde, he is heading east, back to Jekyll on the right-hand side. The girl he tramples is not nine, but eight or ten, even. And leftness and rightness aren't impossible to reverse. According to Richard Dury, another repeated motif is that of the mirror, one of the un uncanny objects found in the cabinet on the last night. Utterson and Poole look into its depths with involuntary horror and see reflections of reflected firelight, rapidly changing chaotic phenomena. Chaotic, but also, of course, natural phenomena. Jekyll initially finds Hyde's face natural to him. He feels happier in body after the transformation and recognises that this too was myself. Here we see a little more of that anti-romantic strain, the idea that, contra Wordsworth, Mother Nature isn't the haven of purity she's cracked up to be. Something that sticks out reading Jekyll and Hyde is how often the characters, when hearing of or witnessing the crimes of Hyde, freeze. Blood is always running cold. There are icy pangs, people are frozen stiff almost as if confronted with something chaotic, volatile and mutable, the blood's tendency is to bed in, become static in retaliation. Nabokov investigates the etymology of the main character's names and finds the root of Hyde in the Danish for haven, the source of Jekyll dripping down from a Danish jokul or icicle. In a throwaway line, Utterson is at home when insensibly he melted, meaning that he confesses to his guest, Mr. Guest, his worries about Jekyll. Another motif is that of wine, another liquid with transforming properties. Stevenson had seen up close the ravages of alcoholism. In the handbook Twelve Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, Bill Wilson describes self-sufficiency as a bone-crushing juggernaut whose final achievement is ruin. Jekyll himself compares his situation to that of an alcoholic. Utterson and Guest sit on either side of Utterson's own hearth with a particular old wine that had long dwelt unsunned in the foundations of his house. There's a ring here of buried natures and whatnot, and strong support for those who see presented in Jekyll and Hyde anxieties about waning British power. 
In the bottle, the acids were long ago resolved. The imperial dye had softened with time as the colour grows richer in stained windows. But I think the transforming potion is potent enough as it is. Nabokov writes, There is something in Stevenson's death in 1894 on Samoa, imitating in a curious way the wine theme and the transformation theme of his fantasy. He went down to the cellar to fetch a bottle of his favourite burgundy, uncorked it in the kitchen, and suddenly cried out to his wife, What's the matter with me? What is this strangeness? Has my face changed? And fell on the floor. A blood vessel had burst in his brain, and it was all over in a couple of hours. What? Has my face changed? There is a curious thematical link between this last episode in Stevenson's life and the fateful transformations in his most wonderful book. The wine transforming potion mirror is one of many dualities and oppositions. Famously, there is Jekyll's house, two stories high, of course, in a block of buildings that are so together about the court that it is hard to say where one ends and another begins. The front of Jekyll's house gives off a great air of wealth and comfort. The back an air of prolonged and sordid negligence. It is much to Enfield's embarrassment that he doesn't at first realise that the grimy building where he first sees Hyde is the back entrance to Jekyll's residence. And yes, in case you're wondering, those critics keen on a homosexual reading have found Hyde accessing Jekyll's quarters via a rear entrance right up their alley. Was Jekyll's back passage a double entendre or was it based on a real double entrance? that of John Hunter, a respectable surgeon who, in the style of Edinburgh's Dr Knox, relied on cadavers to learn about and teach human anatomy. His respectable Leicester Square house also had a rear entrance where so-called resurrection men brought in corpses. And whilst we're on sticky double meanings and concealed entrances, the language of Jekyll and Hyde is as slippery as a buttered frog. According to Richard Dury, both Jekyll and Hyde contain the letter Y, rare in the middle of a word, and a strange sloping and dividing letter that substitutes the straight letter I in Hyde and Kill. Characters perform a doubling or splitting themselves. If he be Mr Hyde, he had thought, I shall be Mr Seek. Jekyll, at one point, seems to accidentally vocalise his mental state when he says, He, I say, I cannot say, I. Often characters echo one another, quite literally. We have common friends, said Mr Utterson. Common friends, echoed Mr Hyde. Use, echoed Poole. And none stranger than itself, echoed the lawyer. Hyde, repeated Lanyon. Seen him, repeated Mr Utterson. Characters often walk around in twos and appear in figurations that Stephen Arata calls structural rhyming, repeating scenarios and spatial positions. Nabokov said that Stevenson musters all possible devices, images, intonation, word patterns and also face false sense to build up gradually a world in which the strange transformation to, to be described in Jekyll's own words will have the impact of satisfactory and artistic reality upon the reader. Taking a particular interest in Stevenson's alliterations in Jekyll and Hyde, Nabokov identified in the following quotes, D sounds as signifying duty, and pl sounds as summoning pleasure. The elderly and discontented doctor, the liberty, comparative youth, the light step, leaping pulses, and secret pleasures. Stevenson's London is not only a landscape, but a soundscape, where cabs crawl from street to street through labyrinths of the lamp-lighted city. Henry James said about Stevenson that he regards the literary form not simply as a code of signals, but as the keyboard of a piano, and as so much plastic material. That was what I was going to ask you. Why does he keep taking the potion? Well, he makes a very, not obscure, but um, cloaked reference to his um, inner sin. And the mm. fact that he'd always he'd always hidden it, whereas other men sort of rolled with it or mm. a, a admitted, you know, to certain slips and flaws. Sure. Um, whereas he'd always bottled it up and been the um, hardworking man of science. So what you're saying is when he drinks the potion, he can completely cut loose. Completely cut loose. And best of all, he's not even responsible because if he loses control and goes over the top with something... He wakes up as Dr. Jekyll and I think he says something like, you know, who who would, it it would be laughable to assume he was a, a culprit. Yeah. Um, because the two aren't even physically similar. Exactly, yeah. Mm. Um, and that's interesting as well. No one says, no one, rem some someone notices that Hyde is wearing Jekyll's clothes towards the end, but no one says like there was There's an a physical aspect similarity, of Jekyll. Yeah. Or it was like a, a sort of, a stretched or obscured version of his face. Which is another distorting thing about the films, of course, because even if... Because if you have the same actor portraying both, you, they kind of... Obviously, they're going to look like... They bank on people recognising the actor, so they're yeah. going to look the same. They look like Bart Simpson and the Bart Simpson in the attic. <laughs> yeah, that was a good episode. And even if they don't do that, there's, there's kind of a... 
they'll they'll do the makeup to make it look like it is a you know your evil twin. Well, did you did, did you see the newest Avengers the film? Demon Shadow. No. When they've got um, Mark Ruffalo as the Hulk, mm. you've got Mark Ruffalo as a normal human being, and then you've got the Hulk with the mo-capped version of Mark Ruffalo's face on it, and it's got that kind of uncanny valley thing. And I'm assuming right. if they ever do another, if they do a modern remake of Jekyll and Hyde, they're going to do exactly the same thing. But they yeah. should go small. They should go real small. They should go small. The worst of my faults, Jekyll says was a certain impatient gaiety of disposition, such as had made the happiness of many, but such as I found hard to reconcile with my imperious desire to carry my head high and wear a more than commonly grave countenance before the public. Many a man would have even blazoned such irregularities as I was guilty of. Now, this could be self-preservation, perhaps a desperate man's last gamble to save his credit, but the very fact that Stevenson keeps it vague suggests that Jekyll's actual sin is not important. At one point in the narrative, Stevenson writes that Utterson might see a reason for his stra- friend's strange preference or bondage, brackets, call it what you please, an odd moment in which we're suddenly addressed, call it what you please, reader. As to a key, said Stevenson, I conceive I could not make my allegory better, nay, that I could not fail to weaken it if I tried. I have said my say as I was best able, others must look for what was meant. Nabokov, however, was adamant that Jekyll and Hyde was not a mystery story or a detective story, parable or allegory. One thing he pointed out that people kept getting wrong was describing Hyde as evil and Jekyll as good. He argued that Jekyll is a composite. Both good and evil exist in Jekyll. Hyde is the character who emerges when Jekyll suppresses his better nature. This complexity makes the book much more affecting and disquieting than a simple werewolf scenario. Yeah, the, the the, the really horrible moments are things like, I think it's one of the servants. The servants get freaked out because Hyde is just in the laboratory and they haven't seen Jekyll in days. Yeah. Um, and he's not letting anyone in. He's not talking to anyone, but they can tell it's Mr. Hyde and not Dr. Jekyll. He's probably stamping about and shouting. Yeah. Uh, and one of the servants says to Utterson, um, or maybe it's Lanyon, I think Utterson, once I heard it weeping. Mm. And that, that's like the creepiest moment. Well, because I think that's, that's, that's the dread. There's an it. There's and, an it. And, and it. also it's, it's not once I heard it, raging or you know screaming for all it was worth or cackling or anything like well, that's that that's kind of like weeping a, is worse isn't it's it? like acceptance yeah i think you could probably you could probably track the five stages of grief at that point grief yeah. for your lost humanity i guess yeah it is not the fact of hyde that makes hyde horrible but what there is of jekyll that remains as nabokov puts it just as parts of unacceptable hyde dwell within acceptable jekyll so over hyde hovers a halo of jekyll horrified at his worse half's iniquity. Another question. Mm -hmm. When Jekyll, we we read Jekyll's confession Mm -hmm. and we hear the story of the first transformation. Yeah. I I was looking out for this because I I was thinking all the way through, it's like, how did Hyde get a name? Yeah, he, does Jekyll name him? Well, yeah. Does he name himself Hyde? In this confession, he describes the first transformation and... It ends with something along the lines of, by the time it was done, I was staring, he was looking in the mirror, and I regarded for the first time the face of Edward Hyde, or something like that. But yeah, Edward Hyde, by Edward the way, Hyde, not, yeah. just, not just Hyde. Yeah, he has, a, he has a full name. He has a full name. Obviously, you'd need to give him a name in order to get deeds and everything, um, and take a, you know, rent a house mm-hmm. and whatnot. But it's interesting, why does he, there's no reference to like why he might pick that name, or... Um, well, it's weird. You've got Jekyll, which is the more unusual name. Yeah. You come across m- more Hydes in real life in terms of as a surname than you do the, J- the Jekyll. Mm. Jekyll almost sounds kind of weird and monstrous anyway as a name. Which is interesting, isn't it? Because if you came across a Jekyll, it would feel like coming across a Mr. Frankenstein. Yes. Whereas, there are, like you say, there are tons of Hydes. Like... Isn't, well, because I think Jekyll could be one of those surnames that's just died out. Yeah. Could have been... Could have been hundreds of Jekylls kicking about back in the day, and Hyde just survived. I don't know. You can only s- does does his sin manifest and give itself a name. Hyde is a is quite mysterious how they ad- actually communicate because they share memories. Uh huh. But um, but is is it like a Hulk situation where Jekyll is conscious inside and can sort of think and speak, but. Is is sort of submissive. I don't think he's submissive, whatever he is. 
G.K. Chesterton wrote, The real stab of the story is not in the discovery that one man is two men, but in the discovery that two men are one man. After all the diverse wandering and warring of those two incompatible beings, there was still one man born, and only one man buried. The point of the story is not that a man can cut himself off from his conscience, but that he cannot. And the fact of Jekyll and Hyde not being polar and warring opposites is reflective in the subversiveness of the language and the landscape. According to Fanny Stevenson talking about her husband's first draft of Jekyll and Hyde, he had Jekyll bad all through and was working on the Hyde change only for a disguise. A change is apparent in the different manuscript drafts of Jekyll and Hyde. Stevenson cleans up Jekyll's originally dirty windows and renovates Hyde's first grimy rooms off the Gray's Inn Road to become a Soho apartment furnished with good taste. Motifs and oppositions in Jekyll and Hyde have, in Richard Jury's phrase, confusingly multiple interpretations. He points out, among many things, Stevenson's use of semicolons. He typically places a semicolon before a conjunction, perhaps to render problematic the link between the two parts of the sentence. Early examples of this are, No doubt the feat was easy to Mr. Utterson, for he was undemonstrative at best. Descriptions of characters are almost always odd, full of oppositions or near oppositions. Mr. Utterson, the lawyer, was a man of rugged countenance, that was never lighted by a smile. Cold, scanty, and embarrassed in discourse, backward in sentiment, lean, long, dusty, dreary, and yet somehow lovable. There's nothing definitely wrong about this. On first reading, you might think there was nothing necessarily unlovable about the rest of the description to justify that and yet somehow lovable. But I suppose unsmiling coldness and dreariness aren't particularly lovable qualities. But those things are so thawed by his backward sentiment, his embarrassment in discord. Naturally, our hearts immediately warm to anyone embarrassed in discourse. And above all, that fact of his dustiness, dusty like an unloved toy. It's the sheer density of description that throws us off. He is so many things that it becomes none of them. I certainly don't read through Strange Case of Jekyll and Hyde, picturing Utterson as a man of rugged countenance. Things get stranger. Later, when we read, hosts love to detain the dry lawyer, we understandably think, why? Is it for his scanty discourse? His leanness? No, we discover instead that they like to sit a while in his unobtrusive company. How many people do you know who are an unobtrusive hoot? Or for that matter, the dusty heart of the party? Other oppositions are much more distinct. Mr Hyde was pale and dwarfish. He gave an impression of deformity without any nameable malformation. He had a displeasing smile. He had borne himself to the lawyer with a sort of murderous mixture of timidity and boldness. This confusing mixture doesn't bode well for Utterson, who thought, if he could but once set eyes on him, meaning Hyde, he thought the mystery would lighten and perhaps roll altogether away, as was the habit of mysterious things when well examined. Given that the story of Jekyll goes some way to disproving that alleged habit of the mysterious, this comes off as another rather dark joke. Other incidental moments seem slyish in hindsight. Hyde says, how did you know me? To which Utterson replies, on your side. The lawyer worries greatly over the strange clauses of Jekyll's will. Jekyll himself says, apparently casually, that he has lost confidence in himself recently. And when Lanyon is confronted by an impatient Hyde, he commands, compose yourself. In some ways, says Richard Jury, reading Jekyll and Hyde is like reading a text in a familiar foreign language. The meaning is clear, but one is constantly aware of things being said in a slightly unfamiliar way. Another component of the text's linguistic oddness is the use of formulas that seem familiar but then turn out to be unusual. Examples are, it was a nut to crack, and as empty as a church. There are also odd lapses into slang or colloquial speech. I've already mentioned that standout reference to what you please, you being us, the reader. But the men of science and law that Jekyll surrounds himself with use slang too, some of which might not cause us 21st century readers much pause, but still makes them sound strange. We can sense the artificiality. As Anthony Burgess says, Slang derives directly from a situation. It cannot be frigidly applied from without. Here it is being deliberately applied from without and sounds all the odder for it. Nabokov said Stevenson's aim was to make a fantastic drama pass in the presence of plain and sensible men. But even the men who don't chug transforming potions at night aren't coming off very plain or sensible. Some references can easily be missed on a first read-through. Mr Enfield, the narrator of the first sighting of Mr Hyde, prefaces his tale of it by saying he was coming home from some place at the end of the world, about three o'clock of a black winter morning, sounding rather like he has an interesting apocalyptic double life of his own. Utterson, if one keeps a tally, comes across as one of life's great voyeurs. He had an approved tolerance for others, sometimes wondering, almost with envy, at the high pressure of spirits involved in their misdeeds. 
In this character, it was frequently his fortune to be the last reputable acquaintance, good influence in the lives of downgoing men. Downgoing men. I put that forward as a triple entendre. Another interesting point is that Utterson, when he first looks on Hyde, who at this point has been built up as being obscurely repulsive, is quite unfazed. Let's skip straight to the end of Jekyll and Hyde. Yep. How does it end again? Uh, so it ends with two letters from characters. So for, for all the way through, we've been hearing from... Bit of epistemology? Is that epistemology? Yeah. Letters. Yeah. I don't know. Just, <laughs> just, swanky bastard. I just never get to use the word. <laughs> um... So we've been hearing from Utterson. Yes, Utterson um, is the lawyer. The lawyer who is very caring. Um, Almost. Has a very strange description in the very start of the book. It's sort of dreary, cold, dour, but lovable. It's a very so peculiar like, set of... Like Eeyore. Uh, <laughs> like Eeyore, basically. <laughs> we've been hearing... Well, we haven't really been hearing from him, we've, but we've been following him. It's third person. Yes. Third, third person, but you only ever see what he sees. Yeah. And then towards the end, he acquires two letters. One is from uh, a friend of Dr. Jekyll's mm -hmm. um, called Lanyon. Yep. And he recounts witnessing a transformation, mm -hmm. which um, shocked him so much that he took to his bed and died. That's which once, I want to once again, very Lovecraft. <laughs> yeah. um, and then he, the final letter he reads is from Jekyll, and it is a kind of confession. And again, it's so quick. You would think that what that was, was the, the bit that would be, you know, a whole new half of the book. It's like that bit in Young Frankenstein, which is the giant book that says, how I did it. How I did it. Yeah, it is basically how I did it. Yeah. Except he keeps certain details very, very secretive. So that no one can ever do it again. So, yeah. Uh, there's that. Although that problem is, is sort of closed anyway, because the salt that he used. So after he uses it a few too many times, he finds that he's waking up in the body of Hyde without having taken the potion, and this freaks him out, so he has to get more of the potion to turn him back into Jekyll. He runs out of the salt that he was mixing uh, in with it, and when he orders some back, it doesn't work, and so he assumes that the chemist has been sending him an impure version of the salt. Uh, towards the end of his days, he realises that probably the first batch he got was impure. And there was the impurities that were the and cause the, of the yeah, transformation. Which means he's fucked, because he doesn't know what the impurity... Um, which is actually did. kind of, which is horrifying in its own way. Really, really horrifying. Um, so there's a, that kind of a fear of um, laws of medicine in with everything else. Well, this is... Just how tangible... I'm not going to bloody stop talking about Lovecraft. <laughs> in the same way that Lovecraft was fear of a cosmic unknown. We'll do an episode on Lovecraft next week and just oh. talk about Stevenson. God, I've, I just want to get into how much, how much I love Lovecraft's writing and how much I hate him as a human being. Okay. Well, I, we have to do an episode now. But, um, yeah... If Lovecraft was fear of a cosmic unknown, then this story is a fear of medicine and science. And, I mean, <clears throat> and so, uh, well, pinning down what really the fear is, hmm. the upstart man, well, what, 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 what the you commoner. What you described at the end there was fear of, that's a, that's a kind of dread when you realise you're completely fucked. Yeah. And Mortal dread. Yeah, the, the, limit, the limits of your knowledge is what's, yeah. what's done you. Hyde's progress is commented on almost in the tones of an invalid marking with alarm the growth of a tumour. The powers of Hyde seem to have grown with the sickliness of Jekyll. He thought of Hyde for all his energy of life as of something not only hellish but inorganic. This was the shocking thing, that the slime of the pit seemed to utter cries and voices, that the amorphous dust gesticulated and sinned, that what was dead and had no shape could usurp the offices of life. It takes an effort to resist a strongly biographical reading of these moments, especially if one has read of the misery Stevenson suffered with his own illness. But he also, quite frankly, thought of himself as a fractured personality, myself and that other fellow. Later in life, he was given, or, given to signing cards Jekyll or Hyde, depending on his own assessment of his current state of mind. Jekyll predicts further fractures. Man is not truly one, but truly two. I say two because the state of my own knowledge does not pass beyond that point. Others will follow. Others will outstrip me on the same lines. And I hazard the guess that man will ultimately be known for a mere polity of multifarious, incongruous and independent denizens. Jekyll has been fleshing out his knowledge for some time, as Lanyon reveals. It is more than ten years since Henry Jekyll became too fanciful for me. He began to go wrong, wrong in mind, and though of course I continue to take an interest in him for old sake's sake, as they say, I see and have seen devilish little of the man. You were going to ask me about this guy retiring to his bed and dying after witnessing the transformation. Yeah, so Dr. Lanyon witnesses he's the first person who actually sees Jekyll yeah. transform how, and how does he describe the transformation is it sort of like a sort of things bubble up from under the skin and he's sort of no no again like I, I, we, we're so um tainted by 
the the cinematic versions, it's very fleeting. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's shocked, and then I'm imagining it's the trans is when um, Scrappy Doo transforms into the giant Scrappy Doo. <laughs> Mate, your of, references um, at on the this end episode. of the live episode, the live action Scooby Doo film. Um, he, yeah. Anyway, after that, Jekyll then that's that, that's actually a happy moment, at least for Jekyll. Um, well, because he's discovered something of scientific import. Well, no, because he's stuck as Hyde. So Hyde tells Dr. Lanyon, because um, there's now a manhunt for Hyde, so he mm. can't go to his own house. Hyde tells, Hyde writes as Jekyll, pretending yeah. to be Jekyll, to Dr. Lanyon saying, go round to my laboratory, go and get my stuff, it's in this drawer, take it to your house, I will come at midnight. Um, and I'll know, show you something marvellous. Drop everything you're doing and do this for me, please, yeah. please, 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 signed Jekyll. So he does it, Hyde comes round, Lanyon is like, you know, who are you? Um, there's a really clever bit where Hyde addresses him directly, says, have you got it, is the first thing he says. And Dr. Lanyon says something like, we haven't even been introduced. And it's really, really good because it, on one hand, Hyde sounds rude and aggressive. But he's also a ex- desperate Jekyll. It, it's, it also makes perfect logical sense for him to address Lanyon directly because... He's got Jekyll's memories, yeah. and so he's talking to his old friend, going, "Well, did you get it? You know, like I would to you, yeah. I- even though I changed bodies." Um, so it's really, really clever, subtle stuff mm. like that, which is another reason why you wonder why this isn't two hundred pages long, because the fun of that sort of well, stuff. But I also think that if you can say something in fifty words, why say it in a hundred? I feel like this addresses everything it needs to in forty pages. Um, so yeah, there's, there are subtleties, but there are subtleties you can get like that in a forty-page. It is awful. Yeah. But my question is, why do you think Lanyon dies? Does it describe... Oh, sorry, sorry, I forgot to say. Does, does it describe the transformation? Yeah, it describes the transformation, which is horrifying, mm. but he t- he's turning into Jekyll, and Jekyll then thanks him, explains everything, and says he's going to, you know, stop, and he'll teach him the mysteries of it. Mm-hmm. And then they, he goes home, safe, day is saved, then Lanyon dies of shock. Is it because he's witnessed something that's sort of beyond the laws of nature? Yeah. Is that the implication? That's the implication, but I don't really think that's enough. Because from cause... The, he's such a robust, like way more than Utterson. When we first meet Lanyon, he's hearty, robust, um, loyal. Yeah, he's also a man of science, but it, I don't think it holds up that oh, you've toppled my, th- uh, you know, my perceptions. I think he would be. Well, there could there could be something about the transformation or something about the the process or witnessing something like that that does. And just just kills you. Maybe Lanyon saw something of his own inner evil. Maybe is it a is it a sort of just a, a failing of of life that kills him? It's not like a suicide or. A... He says something like, "I've had a terrible shock and it's going to kill me." Uh, Utterson goes to see him, and it's bedridden. You're like, yeah, some I don't know how how many days apart or weeks, but in one scene he is happy, robust, hearty, and the next scene he is. A shadow of his former self. Well, his could, hair's whitened. And... Well, it could be that the the thinking on it every day kills him. It could yeah. be the time, the time passing and the more he thinks about it. Yeah. In the build-up to the book's final act, Lanyon is visited by Utterson. Lanyon has his death warrant written legibly on his face. Yes, Utterson thought. He is a doctor. He must know his own state and that his days are counted and the knowledge is more than he can bear. The horror of the transformation, as Lanyon describes it, is characteristically vague. He put the glass to his lips and drank at one gulp. A cry followed. He reeled, staggered, clutched at the table and held on, staring with injected eyes, gasping with open mouth. And as I looked, there came, I thought, a change. He seemed to swell. His face became suddenly black and the features seemed to melt and alter. And the next moment I had sprung to my feet and leaped back against the wall, my arm raised to shield me from that prodigy, my mind submerged in terror. Oh God, I screamed, and oh God, again and again. For there before my eyes, pale and shaken and half fainting, and groping before him with his hands, like a man restored from death, there stood Henry Jekyll. Injected, swell, melt, and alter are the only sensational words. Lanyon might well have described a transformation in full. It wouldn't go unnoticed by a man of science, bubbling flesh, bulging eyes, etc. The horror, though, is communicated not through vocabulary, but through grammar and rhythm. Jekyll's description of it goes as follows. The most racking pang succeeded, a grinding in the bones, deadly nausea, and a horror of the spirit that cannot be exceeded at the hour of birth or death. Then these agonies began swiftly to subside, and I came to myself as if out of a great sickness. There was something strange in my sensations, something indescribably new, and from its very novelty, incredibly sweet. I felt younger, light, happier in body, 
I was conscious of a heady recklessness, a current of disordered sensual images running like a mill race in my fancy, a solution of the bonds of obligation, an unknown but not an innocent freedom of the soul. What is what is their fate then? What is the fate of Jekyll and Hyde? Um, Where do they go to? He becomes a self-destroyer in the interesting words of uh, Mr. Utterson. So, suicide. Suicide, yeah. I wonder whose body they find. Hyde's. Mm. They don't find Jekyll's, which is another bit of the horror. Yeah. Is that Jekyll is just lost. Yeah. And they can't, can't even bury him. Mm. Utterson and Poole break down the door and find the body of Hyde twitching, cords in his face, still spasming. Self-destroyer comes almost as a punchline because Hyde doesn't want to die. It is Jekyll who has destroyed himself. I'm curious about what actually happened in the moments of Jekyll's or Hyde's suicide. Here's what we've heard about the two protagonists' um, thoughts on self-destroying. The hatred of Hyde for Jekyll was of a different order. His terror of the gallows drove him continually to commit temporary suicide and return to his subordinate station of a part instead of a person. But he loathed the necessity. He loathed the despondency into which Jekyll was now fallen and he resented the dislike with which he was himself regarded. Had it not been for his fear of death, he would have long ago ruined himself in order to involve me in the ruin, says Jekyll. But his love of life is wonderful. I go further. I, who sicken and freeze at the mere thought of him, when I recall the abjection and passion of this attachment, and when I know how well he fears my power to cut him off by suicide, I find it in my heart to pity him. In Jekyll's last moments, he writes, should the throes of change take me in the act of writing it, Hyde will tear it to pieces, meaning the note. But if some time shall have elapsed after I have laid it by, his wonderful selfishness and circumscription to the moment will probably save it once again from the action of his ape-like spite. So what's happened here, I wonder? Has Jekyll killed himself mid-transformation? Are the cords and twitches seen on the body of the recently deceased Hyde actually the last moments of him transforming? Or has Hyde taken on a bit of Jekyll? What we're given to think is that Hyde has killed himself and is twitching with rigor mortis or after-death spasms. But it's not in Hyde's character to act this way, to act suicidally. The mystery here is paranormal, yet the uncertain feeling it leaves behind, the contrast of the resolve in Jekyll's note and the abject spectacle of Hyde's body, is one familiar to any suicide. So yeah, what's the, um, what's the cautionary tale of Jekyll and Hyde? Is it to not bottle up your sins? Always check your salts. Always check, always check the purity of uh, your yeah. salts before you put them into your Buy potions. Buy a control salt. <laughs> Try it out on a dog or something. I bet there's loads of films which have done that, like Jekyll testing his potion on a plant. And it turns evil. It evil turns plant. into an evil plant, yeah. So is, is, the, um, is, is the moral of the story about the nature of human sin? I think it's so wide open mm-hmm. that you can attach almost anything. You could make it about addiction. How does it sort of slot in with the rest of Robert Louis Stevenson's works? Oh, is, I mean, it, is, is it an outlier in terms of... The other, the other things he created. He'd have, I think he'd have called it one of his crawlers. Yeah. One of the spooky ones. Because if, if you were to tell somebody who didn't know that Robert Louis Stevenson wrote Jekyll and Hyde, or didn't know anything about Robert Louis Stevenson, but knew all of the famous books, if the, the same person who wrote Treasure Island wrote Jekyll and Hyde, yeah. I think that would be a bit of a, a shock. It would. G.K. Chesterton said, that moment in which Jekyll finds his own formula fail him, through an accident he had never foreseen, is simply the supreme moment in every story of a man buying power from hell, the moment when he finds the flaw in the deed. Such a moment comes to Macbeth and Faustus and a hundred others, and the whole point is that nothing is really secure, least of all a Satanist security. The moral is that the devil is a liar, and more especially a traitor, that he is more dangerous to his friends than his foes. By the way, we've hit upon... For no other reason than we wanted to do this because we enjoyed Dean Stevenson last uh-huh. time and felt like we should do one of his big books as opposed to his tour, yeah. tour book, <laughs> his walking tour. Um, <laughs> but we've hit upon a book that is, again, about male friendship yeah. and metamorphosis. Yeah. and We can't escape it. And ties into Edinburgh in a very loose way. And ties into Edinburgh, yeah. Yeah, well, we've not... I, I, I also aspire a copy of Kafka's Metamorphosis on... Upon your desk. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I was just cr- cross-referencing, you know. Yeah. Well, I think that it is an interesting one of the f- physical transformation that represents a, the mental. Yeah. You think of yourself as a bug and you'll become a bug. Yeah. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Very spooky. Yeah. Um, it's nice to do a Halloween special. We, I think we fluffed it last time, didn't we? I can't remember what we did, but it definitely wasn't spooky. No, I remember. I think we, we meant to and then ended up going out. 
Oh no, that was Burns Night, I think. That was Burns Night. We were trying Night. to do a Burns Night special and then ended up just not going to the pub or something. We did. Uh, we, we went for a Burns Supper, but didn't bother didn't, doing any Burns did, related content. Didn't actually whatsoever. do a podcast. <laughs> um, cool. Well, I think that's enough for Jack yeah. and Hyde. Um, if you're not read, if you're not read it, read it. It'll take you about an hour. Just remember, please check your salts. Check your salts and let us know what the definitive film version of Jack and Hyde is. Yeah, do. Um, I think actually it would be a good adaptations episode mm. if we racked up a few and did, um, you know, pick the best one and discussed why. Mm-hmm. So yeah, if anyone thinks there is the the Jekyll Muppets and Hyde, Jekyll and Hyde. <laughs> well, that's kind of the Michael Caine one to be honest. <laughs> okay, that's everything. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks very much for listening to um, Ear Read This. If you want to keep in touch, we're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Ear Read This. For all of those, you can email us any questions. Ear Read This at gmail dot com. If you'd like to support the podcast, we do have a Patreon page patreon.com slash you read this we will be uploading our first episode there very shortly until next time happy reading I was Jekyll, Jekyll Hyde.